Lakeland Public Television and area news partners are proud to present Debate Night 2012, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now, the Senate District 2 debate. Your moderator tonight is Roy Blackwood. Good evening and welcome to uh, Debate Night 2012. 11 debates over four nights. Tonight's site is Lakeland Public Television Studio in Bemidji. And tonight's candidates, this hour, uh, will be Mr. Dennis Mosier, the Republican candidate, and Mr. Rod Scoey, the Democratic candidate for Senate District 2. Uh, we also have with us a panel of journalists who will be asking questions. Uh, Mr. Dennis Wyman, Lakeland Public Television News Director. Mr. Steve Wagner, Bemidji Pioneer Editor and Mr. Scott Hall, KAXE News Director. The rules for the debate are as follows. Each candidate will have three minutes for an opening comment. Then the panel members will ask questions. Uh, some of the questions will be their own. Others will be uh, elicited from the viewing audience. Uh, each candidate will get two minutes to answer the questions. And then each candidate will have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. These questions will continue until we're about 50 minutes into the debate. Uh, at that time, we'll move to closing comments, and those closing comments will be two minutes each, uh, at which time the uh, debate will close. Are there any questions from the candidates on the, on the rules? Okay, hearing none, then we will move on to the opening statements. Mr. Moser, if we could have your statement first, please. Okay, <clears throat> I'm Dennis Moser. I'm running, like you said, for Senate District 2. I ran for this office two years ago in 2010. I live in Clearbrook, Minnesota. I married uh, my wife Jolene. We have six children and as of the beginning of September we now have 14 grandchildren. So I'm, uh, I'm really proud of my family and most of my family live in the area. All of them live in the Clearbrook Gonvick area, except for one is over by Oakley, which is pretty close, and I have one down in Blaine, Minnesota. And uh, my background is that uh, I was born and raised in Illinois, northern Illinois. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I went to college in St. Petersburg, Florida on the GI Bill. At the same time, I started and ran a small air conditioning company in that area while I was going to college. After that time, I um, moved to Minnesota here and uh, we farmed until we went broke. And after, <laughs> after that, I um, went back and done some management and I worked in the cities. For about two years, I was the commercial manager of a heating and air conditioning company in, many, in uh, Chanhassen. I went to Phoenix, Arizona for two years. They sent me out there to open the branch office in uh, Phoenix. Then we come back here and there was a lot of stuff going on for the kids that I didn't like the atmosphere there. So we moved back to Northern Minnesota and that would have been in 1988. And we've been here since that time. And I drove truck most of that time because of the business opportunities in Northern Minnesota are rather lacking. So I drove truck, which I made a relatively decent living at it. And uh, I retired a little over two years ago from driving truck. So. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Scoey. Well, good evening, viewers, and thank you all for being part of this informational forum this evening. Uh, thanks to Dennis from Lakeland Public Television and Scott Hall from KXA Radio, uh, Steve Wagner, Bemidji Pioneer, for asking the questions and for their organization sponsoring this forum tonight. And thank you, Roy, for moderating. You're always doing a great job. Uh, I am Rod Scoy. I am seeking re-election to be your state senator for Senate District 2 again. I'm married to Sarah Hogberg. She's an early childhood educator in the Clearbrook Gonvick School District. Sarah and I have two grown children. Our daughter, ML, is in the Navy on the USS Kid stationed out of San Diego. Our son, Patrick, is a software uh, developer uh, working out of the cities. Sarah and I uh, live on the farm uh, that we uh, own and operate north of Clearbrook. Uh, kind of right here in the right in the heart of the Senate district. Uh, I grew up in Kellier, went to college at Augsburg, and then moved back up north first to log uh, and, and then to farm. 
Uh, I have been honored and privileged to serve the past 10 years uh, in the Minnesota Senate, representing Senate District 2. Prior to that, I served four years in the Minnesota House. I've been a Clearwater County Commissioner and a Clearbrook Gonvick uh, School Board member. As a school board member, one of the things I learned was how strong our schools really are. Uh, they have excellent kids, excellent staff, uh, good administrations, and you know, committed school board members. But uh, the last number of years, uh, the schools have, have struggled and uh, the state has not fulfilled its commitment to these uh, schools in our area. And after these years of uncertainty, there's been unallotments and funding shifts, our schools have uh, financial problems. The solution to this is to have help from the state in the form of certain and adequate funding. And so, as we think about this, we need to quit borrowing money from our schools and we need to pay back the shift. Now, the schools are song, strong, but they're kind of frayed around the edges. Our cities are in similar shape. They've had unallotments and they've had LGA cuts, and so they need help. Our state is somewhat the same. We're basically strong. Our unemployment rate is below the national average. We are uh, doing well there. But in order for us to continue to excel, we need to change. After 10 to 12 years of divided government in St. Paul, the state is a little worn and a little frayed. And we need a legislature and a governor that are willing and able to work together to make solutions. We need to work with Governor Dayton to fix our budget deficit. We need to make the hard decisions to balance our budget. And as we balance our budget, we need a vision of our future and a vision of where we're going. This evening, I look forward to having an opportunity to discuss my vision with you of where Minnesota is heading. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Uh, we will move directly to questions. The first one coming from Mr. Wyman, Lakeland News. Okay, thanks, Roy, and thank both of you for participating once again. This, of course, a rematch of the 2010 race, and I'm going to, start, going to start with a question regarding natural resources, which, of course, are a big asset for us here in northern Minnesota. Last week, Jeff Forster, the executive director of the Minnesota Lakes and River Advocates, attended the regular meeting at the Hubbard County Coalition. He's pushing the state to have a long-term dedicated source of funding to fight the spread of aquatic invasive species. Zebra mussels, of course, are spreading north. They're now in Pelican Lake and Gull Lake in the Brainerd Lakes area. Would you support a long-term dedicated source of funding to fight the spread of aquatic invasive species? Also, please share your thoughts on the state government's role in slowing down or spreading or stopping or the spread of aquatic invasive species if the state government should have a role. Thank you, Mr. Wyman. Mr. Skoy, first, please. You know, we, we had a forum in Detroit Lakes on aquatic invasives, and this really is one of the most serious environmental challenges the state is going to face in the coming years. And it's going to take a two-pronged approach to solve this. We're going to need to do research at the state level, at the University of Minnesota, to figure out how we're going to eliminate these pests that are in our waters. And really, there are other invasive species besides aquatic, but aquatic are the, the most urgent right now. And so we're going to do that. Now, we did put some money in last session to help start the research center at the University of Minnesota. But at the same time we're doing research on how to eliminate these pests, we have got to figure out how to stop the spread of them. And there are a number of initiatives the Department of Natural Resources is working on to try to do that. But right now we are really failing. And in order to do this, it's going to take funding. And as you mentioned in your question, very likely a dedicated funding. But it could also just be general fund because water is really Minnesota's prime resource we're the land of 10,000 lakes. We should probably be able to use state dollars to solve the problems of our state waters. And so I know it's a real problem. It's gonna take dollars to fix it. And uh, I worked on this in the Environment Committee last year. I'm a member of the LCCMR, which is the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. We have been uh, working hard to try to find the dollars and the money to control this. And we're also trying to do the research at the same time, but a very important problem and issue that the next legislature is going to have to wrestle with again. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Mr. Mosier. This is a 
very important uh, issue that uh, we need to address. And I don't know whether we need a separate source of funding at this time. We have the legacy fund, which when that was passed, that was supposed to be used to protect our waters and our streams. And that fund has been used for uh, um, other things like the DNR purchasing land, which uh, as of now, Minnesota is one of the largest landowners in Minnesota. There's a sizable amount of land that's owned by the DNR. And of course that compounds our problems because it takes the uh, land off the tax rolls. So then it hurts our uh, counties and our townships by not having that. But on the aquatic uh, invasive species, spe species issue, we of course, should take some of that money, that's what the money was for, is for the lakes and the streams to protect the waters. We need to take some of that money. We need to use that uh, for whatever means we need. We do need research on it, but we also need to go to the source. And I haven't done a lot of research on that, so I'm not real sure what it, uh, where it all is, but I do know that some of it comes in through the Great Lakes when the uh, ships come in. They have water from a foreign country in their holds and they're coming in to pick up ore, or iron ore, or whatever it is they're coming in to pick up. And they dump that water in our lakes here. And so we need to also control the uh, species that are coming in as well as get rid of them now that they're here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mosier. Mr. Scoy, any uh, rebuttal? Well, not a rebuttal, but just a further, further comment. Uh, De Dennis is right about uh, controlling uh, the, those species coming into our state. You know, we've got these Asian carp that are in the Mississippi River, and we're going to have to <clears throat> find a way to stop them from coming north. Uh, if they get beyond the Coon Rapids Dam, uh, they will be in the Mississippi River system in the center part of the state. So we're going to have to figure out a way to do that. And, of course, uh, the legacy money, a lot of that was for uh, natural resources. Uh, water certainly was part of the discussion as when Minnesotans were voting to expand the sales tax. And so it's, uh, it's appropriate that some of that money goes to there. Now, if, if that money is not adequate, uh, there has been discussion about whether uh, there would be an additional sticker on boats. Uh, I think perhaps the trailers are more of a problem uh, than the boats, but uh, that'll be part of the legislative discussion that's coming up this next year. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moser, any further comments? I don't think so. I think we pretty much covered it for now. Okay. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the second question from Mr. Wagner of the Bemidji Pioneer. When we talk about rural areas, we think of agriculture, forestry, the environment, is particularly uh, tourism in northern Minnesota, but rural cities are also hurting. Jobs was Tim Pawlenty's attempt to help those communities when he served as governor. What should the state do now to help those communities, uh, both small and large, in rural Minnesota? Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Mosier, your answer, please. I'm gonna let me start out with a difficult one here because we have so many issues that are involved as far as employment is concerned and we have agriculture, we have tourism, and all these issues, if we don't have a strong agriculture, we're not gonna have a strong economy. If we don't preserve our natural resources, we're not gonna have a tourism industry. So all these things, even the prior question, all these things work together. And the agriculture and the tourism is also what keeps our rural cities strong. Now, I'm not an advocate of raising taxes, I think we need to keep our taxes low so that if possible we can get industry and we can get businesses into the rural areas because I would like to see the people staying in the rural areas rather than moving to the large cities. I think we need to have a program to where people that are interested in building houses, if they can afford to buy a five acre plot, they should be allowed to build on a five acre plot. I think we need to have things that we encourage our students once they go out, they get an education, they come back to rural Minnesota, I think we need to encourage them to stay in the area and we have to uh, provide some type of employment for these individuals to stay in the area. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moser. Uh, Mr. Skoy. 
You know, it's always a challenge uh, trying to attract jobs uh, to the state and, and to our rural areas, but it is doable. And uh, when Roseau flooded and the Polaris folks were asking for help for their community, they talked about how important it was to have a vibrant community, good schools, they needed good health care facilities as they tried to recruit engineers to come and live in Roseau. The same down in Jackson when AGCO was moving its uh, tractor plant into that area. So we have to make sure that our communities are strong. As I was mentioning in the, my opening, you know, our communities have gone through unallotments and LGA cuts. It's, it's hurting them, it's hurting their budgets. So we need to make sure that our communities are strong financially and that they're vibrant. Now from there, then we need to find ways for people to have good employment. I think with the advent of the internet and the work that a lot of our rural telcos are doing, bringing fiber optics to rural areas, people are gonna be able to work wherever in this world. I know my son has talked about his company giving them the opportunity to distance work uh, after they've been with the company for a couple of years. He's excited about it because it would free him up. He could come home on the weekends and work Friday at home and and, uh, and not have that Friday afternoon traffic problem. So we've got things that we can do. We can strengthen Minnesota's investment fund to try to uh, attract jobs into our area. And uh, you know we'll just have to keep plugging away at it. Uh, agriculture and natural resources are our strong suits. Uh, of course, you look around, the natural resources is not just logging, it's also tourism. And there's all kinds of things that we can do to uh, have economic development. But it starts with strong communities and then the infrastructure for uh, those communities to grow. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Uh, Mr. Mosier, any rebuttal? Well, I don't know if it's a rebuttal or not, but I would just like to also add that we do have a lot of uh, regulations on our uh, forestry and on our logging and uh, on some other uh, industries that I think if we would ease up some of these regulations and make it more, uh, make it easier for these uh, businesses to do business in our area, I think that it would help go a long way towards bringing more jobs to our community. Thank you, sir. Mr. Scoy, any further comment? Yeah, and I'd just like to, to follow up a little farther on that. We did, we did work last session uh, with Governor Dayton and the legislature to try to streamline the permitting process. And we are making some slow progress on getting these permission, permits issued in a more timely manner. Now I know with the biodiesel, uh, cellulosic biodiesel plants, there's a couple of them that are trying to come into the area. And because they're new technologies, they're taking longer than we would like. So I think that the effort uh, needs to continue to try to make sure that the uh, permitting process is smooth and reasonable and doesn't delay companies from coming in. At the same time, we need to make sure that, you know, we're protecting our water and air. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hall from uh, KEXE, third question, please. Thank you, Roy. Seems a fundamental difference between uh, Republicans and DFLers, uh, not only in Minnesota, but perhaps nationwide, is, is there different ideas about the role of government in, in uh, our, our state and uh, Republicans in general uh, want to shrink the size of government and turn as many uh, functions over to private sector. DFLers have a greater faith in the role of government or maybe a larger role in, in the state economy and, and also in solving some of our problems. Um, I guess this goes fun, and also I think that difference uh, it has a lot to do with what we call gridlock or the inability to get things done, why we have uh, special sessions and things like that. That, that fundamental difference. So in a way, I'm kind of asking you guys, uh, why are you a DFL or why are you a Republican? And what is your idea of an appropriate role for, of government in managing the state? Or, and also, if you would uh, eliminate some functions of the state, what would they be? And how could the private sector maybe do, uh, do something that the state is doing now? Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Scoy, your response, please. Well, let me start by uh, disagreeing just a little bit. I think that there is a f difference in the ro what they think of the role in government, but I really think the primary difference between the two parties is around tax policy. And the tax policy then follows through to as you have shortages of tax revenue, government does shrink. So maybe we are heading to where you were heading in your question. Um, you know, the Republicans, they 
didn't, they don't like state taxes, they don't like the uh, income tax, and they don't like the sales tax. Uh, Democrats appear, from my perspective, to be more concerned about the property tax. And when I look back at the last session and the resolution of the government shutdown, I, I see that playing out because, you know, Governor Dayton had proposed a income tax, a fourth tier income tax. Uh, that was rejected. Uh, we went to government shutdown. We ended up with the elimination of the Homestead Market Value Credit, which was the property tax that we all paid, which was agreeable to the, to the Republican Party. So I, I see that fundamental difference there. And as to the role of government, when you're dealing with aquatic invasives, as we just talked about, you're going to need some regulations to control the spread. And you're going to need some resources to enforce those regulations. So the government does have a role. Now there are times when the government needs to step back and let innovators work and business do its, uh, its thing. But you know, you also have to balance all of this out and make sure that uh, uh, the people that are in the area are enjoying the benefits of those businesses too. You know, I've always been a little bit surprised uh, that uh, uh, these uh, claims that the Democrats are not supportive of businesses is, is come around because we have always been very supportive of the workforce, which is important for business. Uh, the Democrats supported the Minnesota Investment Fund, which is recruiting businesses to this state. And, you know, really, Minnesota has a very good business climate. Thank you, Mr. Chicoy. Uh, Mr. Mosier, your response, please. Well, we have an awful lot of issues there wrapped up in uh, one question. To start out with, I do believe in smaller government. I don't believe in government doing things that the uh, private sector are capable of doing, and in most cases, much better at doing at uh, uh, less cost. I do believe in personal responsibility, and I believe in personal accountability. Now, in order to have personal liberty, we have to have individual <laughs> accountability and responsibility. And we've lost that, it seems like, in a lot of people now, because they're, uh, they don't want to be responsible for themselves. They want somebody else to be responsible for them. I think uh, th th this whole issue of government and everything, I think I need to be responsible. I don't need government telling me every little thing to do and when to do it. And if I'm responsible, if I live in a responsible way, and if I take care of the natural resources that God has given us, if I take care of the river that runs through my property, if I do the things that I need to do, I don't need government to tell me to do it. And this is one of the things that we have lacked, is we have had people that have come into the area and they want to pollute the rivers, they want to pollute the lakes, there is, don't seem to be the responsibility. So. I don't like this idea of uh, all these different flavors of political parties where we see Democrats and Republicans because there, if anybody has a good idea, it's a good idea. I don't care what side of the aisle they're on. It doesn't make any difference. But I do, I do come down on the side of more personal responsibility, of smaller government, and of allowing the private sector to pick uh, more of the responsibility up. Thank you, Mr. Moser. Mr. Scoy, any rebuttal? Well, just a further comment. You know, we've kind of focused in on a small section of government, some of the environmental issues are, are permitting that they do. But I try to remind people that the vast majority of the money that's spent at the state government is a pass-through government that goes to schools, it goes to nursing homes, it goes to higher ed institutions. You look at the state budget and the vast majority of it is not uh, money that's spent in St. Paul, it's money that's spent in our communities to educate kids, uh, money that's spent uh, to take care of people in nursing homes, and you know, to have uh, good, adequate, uh, high quality uh, colleges and universities for our workforce to attend to. And you know, so uh, that is that is government. It, the school teacher is a government employee. The person who works in the nursing home, while uh, it might not be a government-owned uh, facility, uh, the, the reimbursements for all the MA people in there is coming out of the government. And so uh, it's not just regulation that we're talking about. It's all the other uh, parts of uh, our economy and our world that, uh, that rely on uh, community funding. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Mosier, any further comment? Well, there is one thing that uh, Senator Scoy said that I think that is uh, crucial, and he talked about the money that passes through from the state. That's one of the things that I would like to see eliminated. I would like to see local money stay local rather than go to the state and come back because it seems like in the process of the time it travels to St. Paul and travels back, I don't know what happens, but I think some of that money gets lost along the way. I think that the more of the responsibilities we can leave with the local government at the uh, local level, the better off we are. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wyman, next question, please. Let's start talking about education. What should the state's role be in funding education, both K through 12 and higher education, and what changes, if any, would, would you support? Thank you, sir. Mr. Mosier? Well, I, I think a lot of the funding for education does come from our uh, property taxes, from the school levies, and I think the state shouldn't be uh, playing around with our school funds. I think our schools need to have the funds, need to have the money that they're supposed to have. And that also is not a, uh, from what I can see, is not a Democrat or a Republican uh, issue so much as it's a matter of we have a spending issue. We have money coming into the state and we spend more than we have coming in and so then we're taking and borrowing from the schools. I don't think that we should be doing that. I think we should be living within our means, and I think that uh, our schools would be better off. I think there is sufficient money for the schools if the money was uh, appropriated uh, properly to the schools the way it should be. And I also think that the schools themselves, I think they need to learn to uh, live within their means also, because there are things in the schools that we can get along without that uh, they seem to think are extremely necessary and we can uh, cut down on a lot of the extras that we have in the schools and I think we need to have the best education we can have but I'm not one of these people that I think that everything has to be uh, top-notch to have a top-notch education I went to a one-room schoolhouse and in that one-room schoolhouse there was eight grades and in the sixth grade they sent me back to the city school from the one-room schoolhouse I was already, I didn't do anything from sixth grade to eighth grade because I'd already learned everything that they were teaching in the other schools. Thank you, Mr. Moser. Mr. Scoy. Well, uh, school funding in Minnesota is involved, I will say. I don't want to say complicated be because it, I don't think it is all that complicated. But since 1971, after the Minnesota miracle, uh, the school funding was trying to be removed off of the property tax and they instituted a statewide sales tax to pay for schools and other things because they thought that it would be much more fair and more uniform across the state. In our state's constitution is a requirement that we provide a general and uniform education to the children of the state. And in order for us to have this general and uniform opportunity for kids to learn, we need to have equitable and equal funding. And that's why it's coming out of the state as opposed to the local property tax. Because if you're gonna take the property tax dollars off of a very small rural town and try to fund your school solely with that, those kids won't have the same opportunities as a child that's raising in a area with more property wealth on the outskirts of the metropolitan area. So we're trying to equalize the educational opportunities for kids. And so that's why uh, the state is involved. Now we go to 2001 when Jesse Ventura was governor and technically the state was supposed to take over the base funding of schools. And that's the part that the commitment that the state hasn't been keeping to the schools. And now it's even worse because we're borrowing from them for uh, state budget issues. So we need to solve this. We need to quit the shifts uh, and pay for the schools on a timely basis. Now there's a reason for the 90-10 delay because school payment is made on a per pupil unit basis and at the end of the year you do an accounting to find out how many per pupils you had and then you have that 10% less to adjust to make sure that the money comes out right. But uh, the state needs to live up to its promises to the schools. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mosher, any further comment? I think that the state 
I also think the state needs to live up to its promise to the schools. And I don't think it ought to be a back and forth issue down at the state. I don't think that it, when it's uh, been proposed to be paid back that the government should veto it. And I also don't think that the uh, House or the Senate should prevent it from being paid back. Either way, I don't think is right. I think, th I think that that needs to be taken care of first for the schools. But I still think that the more local control we can have, I think the better off we are. Thank you, Mr. Moser. Mr. Scoe, any uh, further comment? Well, and the part of the question did deal with higher ed funding. So I would like to uh, just briefly say that uh, the state has a goal of paying for 67% of the cost of educating a, uh, a student at one of our state public uh, colleges or universities. Uh, when I got into the legislature, it was about 68% that they were paying. In the intervening years, as we've not had any uh, uh, increases in state revenue to help pay for those costs, that percentage has dropped down to, I think it's around 46% now. So those costs have shifted onto the student, and that's why the student tuition costs have gone up so high at our uh, state schools and universities. And this is our future workforce, and if we want to saddle them with debt, so that they don't go to school, it's going to hurt our economy in the long run. So we need to figure out a way to fix this, either through fi finding lower tuitions or improving the state grant program. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Mr. Wagner, next question, please. Well, we're talking a lot about money, and so I'm going to ask you guys to be uh, specific here. How do you deal with what many people would predict as a state budget deficit next year? Would you cut programs, and if so, which programs? If you're going to raise taxes, which taxes would you raise? Please be specific so voters know just where you stand on the issues. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Skoy. Well, the, the, the first thing I want to say is that as my mailbox is filled up with campaign brochures proclaiming that we went from a $6 billion deficit to a billion dollar surplus, that's not true. Uh, uh, the deficit that the legislature dealt with at the February forecast was $4.6 billion, and there is no surplus because the bills aren't paid. So uh, that, I, I don't know where that number is coming from, unless they're thinking you get your paycheck on Thursday and your bills aren't due till Friday, and so you've got a lot of money to have a good Thursday night. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, we've got a revenue and a spending problem. I don't serve on the finance committee, so I'm not going to get real specific about where the, the cuts are going to come. I know there's been very uh, significant cuts to a lot of areas that we didn't want to make reductions in, so I, I think that that's going to be hard. I know there's some to come. But in the tax area, Governor Dayton had a proposal out there that would have raised uh, revenue to help the state's budget. Now, was it perfect? Uh, probably not. Could we make something different? Yes. Can we explore uh, sales taxes? I would think we could. Uh, Minnesota is one of the few states in the nation, I think there's three, that tax clothing. We should look at that. I'm not saying that that's where we should go, but it's, it's an option. And that's why the legislature meets, is to explore all these options. You know, when uh, uh, Governor Ventura was uh, in office, we lowered the income taxes in Minnesota twice. And we also eliminated uh, the school property tax, supposedly. It's now been restored. But we could take some of those income tax reductions back and try to use those dollars to help our state. We cut the taxes during the good times. Perhaps now when we're struggling a little bit, uh, we could take a little bit of that back, particularly on the Minnesotans that have benefited the most from the good economy in this state. Thank you, Mr. Segoy. Mr. Moser. Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's possible for me to give you a lot of specifics because I haven't been down at the legislature and I don't know all that's taken place down there. And so I don't know what all the um, items are that uh, uh, make up the budget at this time. I do know that uh, uh, when we talk about going from a uh, deficit to a surplus, of course, you know, that's all in the way you look at it. I'm not going to say we have a surplus. I'm not going to say, you know, a, a deficit. But I will say that uh, we're in better shape than we were two years ago, financially. So uh, I'm not going to give you specifics on that. I do think 
that uh, we don't have a revenue problem at this time. I think we have a spending problem. We're told that uh, the individuals down there in the Capitol, that they're cutting a lot of the programs when all they're doing is preventing the automatic increases that come with inflation. If you hold the budget at a specific level, rather than allowing the automatic increases, we're told that we're cutting all these programs. And a lot of times uh, the people that benefit from the programs think that we're taking food out of their mouth or we're taking money away from the nursing homes when all we're saying is that uh, we're going to keep it at a certain level until the state gets in better shape. And so I think that uh, it's hard for me to come up with a lot of specifics because I don't know what all the issues are at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Mr. Skoy, any further comment? Yeah, and Dennis, I wouldn't expect you to know the details of the state budget, but let me just help you a little bit. Over 40% of it goes to our K-12 schools. 12% of it goes to higher education. 26% of it goes to health and human services. Everybody thinks about that as the welfare budget. It's not. It's mom and dad or the grandparents in the nursing home. Prime, the largest part of that is MA payments going to long-term care facilities. So you start adding that stuff up, there just isn't a lot of discretionary money in there. At one point, there was a proposal, we could have eliminated all the state agencies and it wouldn't have been enough savings to solve the deficit that we had. So we want to be as efficient as we can. Of course, we're going to do all we can to save money. There's going to be cuts this next year. There's going to be about a $4 billion deficit, three and a half to four, that the next legislature has to deal with. The school shift by statute has to be paid back. That's two point some billion dollars. So then you've got that and then whatever goes on top of it. So it's going to be financial challenges coming up and uh, hopefully we're figuring out how to deal with them. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Mr. Mosier, any further comment? I don't think I will at this time because I don't know that much about the issues to, uh, you know, intelligently answer. Okay, fine. Uh, the next question, Mr. Hall. Okay, Roy, thanks. Um, Minnesota voters next month will be asked to approve or turn down two proposed amendments to the Minnesota Constitution. One is the f of voter photo ID amendment requiring all eligible voters to produce a, an approved photograph of them to prove their el to support their eligibility to vote. And the other one has to do with the same-sex marriage, in this case banning same-sex marriage in the Constitution. How do you both feel about those? Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Mosier, your comments, please. You would give me this one first, wouldn't you? Um, on the, well, actually on both of the amendments. I am for both of them, personally, but I think by it coming up on the ballot, I think the citizens have the opportunity, which is their constitutional right, to be able to vote on these issues. They can vote it up, they can vote it down. I don't know why we have to have a lot of argument over it. It's being put forth to the public so that they have the opportunity to go to the polls and to let the state know what their wishes are. I would much sooner have it done this way than I would for the legislature to ram something through and tell us this is the way it's going to be. I think this was um, probably, in my mind anyway, this was the best way to go about it and allow the citizens to use their best judgment on what they think is, a fair, is fair on these issues and then to vote according to what their conscience is. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Mr. Sikoy. Well, I, have, I, I don't think I've ever voted for a constitutional amendment in my time in the legislature. So I don't believe in that as a mechanism for legislating. Uh, having said that, uh, the definition of marriage amendment isn't gonna change <laughs> Minnesota whether it passes or not, it's current law. So there's nothing that isn't going to change our state at all. Now the voter ID is a different matter. There's issues there to resolve about uh, what are we going to do with uh, mail-in ballots? Uh, what is going to be considered a legal government issued ID? What happens to my, your, your child who goes to college in St. Peter and doesn't change his address because he comes home and works in the summertime? Is he going to drive up to Bagley and get an absentee ballot? Or how is he going to figure out so that he can vote when the address on his uh, driver's license says Clearbrook and he's in St. Peter? And then, you know, there's going to be significant problems with our 
parents, grandparents who lose their driver's licenses because they're getting older. They get in a nursing home. Who's going to take them to Bagley to get this government issued ID? What's the deal with the cost? You know, the advocates of this, this passed the Senate floor two years ago. It's not like they didn't have time to work on this. We asked the advocates, what are the answers to these questions? The answer always came up, well, let the 2013 legislature deal with it. Well, if it's this important, shouldn't we know what the ramifications are going to be before we put language into our state's constitution to require a photograph to vote? Voting is a right. It's not something to be triveled with. And there's no evidence of fraud. So I, I think that we need to know what the ramifications are before we start adding language to the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Skoy. Mr. Mosier, in rebuttal. Well, <clears throat> on the uh, voter ID, there's, he, uh, Senator Skoy brings up a lot of issues and he talks about the mail-in and uh, that that's going to create a problem. I don't, I don't see how that could be a problem. All you do is put your ID number or the last four your social security number on your ballot when you mail it in. You've got your ID taken care of. And uh, you talk about the address difference. That, that shouldn't make any difference as long as you got the ID. There's nothing in the bill that talks about, uh, that I can see anyway, that talks about the address. Uh, you'll have a uh, conditional ballot. And uh, once that uh, is, once your address is provided, that vote will count. The only thing it does is that that vote will not count until that address is ver they're verified. And we have the same process now that they go through to verify it. And uh, there was a lot of addresses that were not verifiable uh, two years ago. Thank you, Mr. Moosh. Mr. Skoy, any, any uh, well, further comment? Well, I mean, you can't just use your last three digits of your driver's license as a photograph. The language that they're proposing being added to the Constitution says you have to show a photograph to vote. When are the people who get mail-in ballots going to show their photograph? Comes in the mail, they mail it back. There's no opportunity there. These are questions that should have been answered before the ballot question was passed on to be on the ballot. They had two years to do this, they didn't do it. I can't understand why, but I just think it's not a good idea if you don't know the ramifications to be making changes to the Minnesota Constitution. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question, Mr. Wyman. Do you support any changes in health care reform? If so, please speak specifically about what you would support. If not, please explain why you feel things should remain the same. Okay, that would be Mr. Scully first, please. One of the most challenging uh, financial areas, and we talked a little bit about this when we talked about the MA costs for our long-term care facilities, is health care. And long-term care is part of health care. And uh, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with the ever-increasing costs. Because as the technology improves and the treatment improves, people want those new technology and treatments. They're expensive. So we're going to have to figure that out. But there are a couple things that we can do that will benefit our area and the rural areas particularly. One of them is to get the, uh, everybody on an insurance plan so that the reimbursements are the same as the private insurance plans and not the reimbursement rates that the governments pay. Because there's lots of cost shifting going on in health care. And uh, what, they, what happens is they go to the local provider or the hospital and they negotiate a reduced rate for large insurance plans and the government is the worst for MA and they're paying about 50 cents on the bill dollar now. And if you only have a small number of patients that pay that way, you can absorb those costs. But a lot of our facilities up in northern Minnesota, the percentage of patients can be 40, 50 percent, I've heard as high as 80 percent that pay with those mechanisms. So we've got to figure that out, and getting these health exchanges in place will be helpful. And the other thing that is going to be helpful, and it's a very small start, but I see that the administration now is taking 3% of the MA dollars and is going to redistribute them based on quality. And Minnesota's always had high quality and good outcomes, and that should be a benefit, and hopefully that quality index number will continue to grow because that will benefit Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Scoy. Mr. Mosier, your comments, please. I don't think the 
government needs to be involved in health care. I think health care should be between the doctor and the patient. And I know we have insurance companies involved and we have all this other stuff, but I don't want some bureaucratic panel sitting in Washington, D.C., telling the doctors what kind of a decision they should make. That's, uh, that's not my idea of good health care. And in Minnesota, we have these uh, health care exchanges that they're talking about setting up, and I think we need to uh, proceed based on the assumption that uh, uh, health care bill is going to stand, but depending on what happens, I don't think uh, we need to go to the extent that uh, we can't reverse that in case this uh, health care bill is uh, either done away with or changed in some way. Now, do we need to do something different for health care? Absolutely, because the health care system is broke. But I don't think that government is the answer. I think we, uh, there, we, we can have um, uh, tort reforms. We can have lots of other different things that we can do that will bring the cost of health care down. And since the health care bill has went into effect, actually insurance rates have risen, which they were supposed to go down, and they've actually gone up by more than what they said they would uh, decrease. So it, it's not working the way it is now, and it will continue to get, get worse the more of it that's implemented. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. Square, Battle? The, the question is not about the treatment, because the doctor and the patient are going to decide the treatment. The question is about how you pay for the treatment. And currently, the government is the largest health care payer in the country through Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, they're already making significant payments to health care providers. We just need to figure out a way to be more efficient. And we need to figure out a way to get the administrative costs down. So we're not paying a lot of people to file a whole bunch of different forms based on the insurance company's co-pays or deductibles or whatever. And this will make us get more health care for the dollar that we pay. Some of these insurance companies have 30% administrative costs. If we can get that down into single digits or to 10%, think of the savings. That's what we have to work on. That's part of the goal and part of the effort. And uh, I think it's important for us. Thank you. Well, Mr. Moser, any other comments? Well, as far as the administrative costs are concerned, the government would have a lot higher administrative costs than what the private industry does. But um, I think, one, again, I said earlier, I believe in personal responsibility and I believe in uh, taking responsibility for yourself. Now, when I say that, a lot of this issues with health care, we say, we see a lot of people, they say, I've got health care, so I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to run to the doctor every five minutes. When our children were little, we didn't run to the doctor every five minutes. We took care of a lot of the stuff at home. We had very few uh, doctor bills compared to what there are now when you run to the doctor all the time. Again, we have to have personal responsibility and personal accountability in everything we do. That includes health care and the whole gamut of whatever we're talking about. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, that concludes the time that we have for questions. So we'll move now to closing comments. And uh, that would be uh, Mr. Mosier first. Well, I think that we have so many issues that are taking place in this country at this time. We have to look at the whole uh, landscape of the political issues and we have so many um, accusations going on about each party. I think it's time that we quit having personal attacks. I think it's time that we stop blaming everybody else. I think it's time that we start taking responsibility for ourselves, for our families, and for our state and for our country. I think the time of passing the buck is past. I think we have to start and live within our means. I don't think we can uh, expect somebody else to pay for our uh, education and pay for everything. On higher education, I think it's great if you have a lot of money. In a tight economy, and you tell me that you're going to pay somebody else's uh, college through a state fund, why is it that I have to pay taxes to pay somebody else's child to go to school? Why is it that they can't either get a loan or have their parents pay for it? 
And they say, well, our parents can't pay for it. No, but you expect everybody else's parents to pay for it through their taxes. So what I say is that uh, I think it's great when you have a booming economy, when there's lots of money around, but when there isn't a lot of money, we have to be a lot more frugal with what we have and we can't just be giving away money just because it uh, makes us feel good or because we think that they need to go to college. I don't think everybody needs to go to college. We have a lot of trade schools, we have a lot of vocational schools, we have a lot of jobs out there that do not require a college education that actually pay higher than a lot of the college education degrees pay. So I think that we need to do a reevaluation and we think, have to look back to ourselves and to our families to see which, which direction this country is going to head. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sukhoi, your closing comments, please. Uh, thank you. And, and before I go to closing comments, I just want to say about Medicare's administrative costs. They're 6 or 7 percent. And that's because there's two questions. Are you over 65? Are you a U.S. citizen? Thanks for the questions tonight. And thank you, viewers, for your time. It's important for you to have the best information that you can as you head out to do one of the most important civic activities that there are voting. I hope this evening has been helpful to you. As I think about our direction, about our state's vision, and where we as a state are going, I know that our state's budget's going to drive a lot of these de decisions and directions. If we're going to have good schools, high quality, affordable colleges and universities, if we're going to have well-funded, caring, long-term care facilities, we'll need to get our budget in order. If we're going to have strong rural com communities, we're going to need some property tax relief. And to accomplish all these things, we need a balanced budget. My vision has us working to reform our tax system while at the same time balancing our budget. To balance the books fairly and openly, no more shifts, no more gimmicks, no more borrowing from the future. I will stand strong that taxes that we pay should be fair and based on one's ability to pay and in a process that's easy to understand. I'm not only an experienced legislator, I'm a business owner. My farm is an employer and we add to the area's economy. Plus this farm work that I do brings another of, a number of economic tax and regulatory experiences to, my, to me that I use to inform the debate as important decisions are being made in St. Paul. I think this is a real plus. And this is my vision of being an effective legislator, adding to the debate, making good decisions, and moving our state forward. I ask for your support as I continue the effort to improve our area and all of Minnesota. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that concludes the uh, District 2 Senate debate for this evening. Uh, Mr. Moser, Mr. Scoy, thank you very much for your time coming here to share your ideas and your thoughts with the voters. Thank you to the panelists for your astute questions, and especially thank you to the viewers for taking your time to become informed before voting. Uh, if you would like to uh, get a recap of tonight's uh, debate, there will be one in tomorrow morning's Pioneer. Uh, the next televised debate will be uh, in very few minutes uh, at 8 p.m. for candidates for the House District 2A, uh, and that's Roger Erickson, Democrat, and Dave Hancock, Republican. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you.